Good evening and welcome to worship tonight. My name is Pastor Tim Wells, pastor of Cross of Christ Lutheran Church in Aurora, Nebraska. And welcome you to our Wednesday night Lenten series. Our theme for this series is Places of the Passion. Each night we visit a different place of the Passion, a place that played a significant role in the story of salvation. Tonight, we visit the Garden of Gethsemane. Let's begin our service. We begin in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I will go to the altar of God. And please say with me, to God my exceeding joy. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Please say with me, maker of heaven and earth. We now bow our heads and together we confess our sins to God. O oh, Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor, sinful being. Do you believe that the forgiveness that I speak is not my forgiveness but God's? If so, say, I do. In the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Having received God's forgiveness, we now turn to his word. We begin with our first reading from Isaiah 53, 1 through 5. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his stripes we are healed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading comes from the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, verses 11 through 18. Paul writes, Therefore remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. By abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now we turn to the gospel. 
Tonight's Gospel reading coming from the Gospel of Matthew, the 26th chapter, beginning with the 47th verse. While Jesus was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a great crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man, seize him. And Judas came up to Jesus at once and said, Greetings, Rabbi. And he kissed him. Jesus said to Judas, Friend, do what you came to do. Then they came up and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. And behold, one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back into its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my Father, and he will at once send me more than twelve legions of angels? But how then should the scriptures be fulfilled, that it must be so? At that hour, Jesus said to the crowds, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day I sat in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me. But all of this has taken place that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples left Jesus and fled. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. As we now prepare to hear our sermon, I ask that you would pray with me. Lord God, may the words of my mouth, may the meditations, may the thoughts of all of our hearts, all of our minds, be pleasing in your sight. Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Hello and welcome back as we continue our tour of the places of the passion. Today we visit the Garden of Gethsemane. I love gardens. You might be able to tell that with the, the plants that I have behind me. My office is filled with plants and at home in the summer we always plant a, a big garden, several gardens actually. I love gardening. But as we begin our conversation about gardens tonight, I want to start by talking about salt. This is a chunk of rock salt that I picked up while I was in Israel. This is a picture of the Dead Sea, and it's called dead for a reason. There's no life in the Dead Sea or in the region surrounding the Dead Sea. What looks like snow and ice floating on a lake is actually a bunch of salt forming on the surface of the water as the water evaporates. And because of the high levels of salt in this region, nothing's able to grow. The chunk of rock salt that I showed you a moment ago, I found in this cave. Now you see this sign, we had a little bit of fun as we entered the cave, because here's this sign at the entrance saying, don't enter too dangerous, but of course, we entered anyway. And we entered this cave 
in order to see salt. All that dirty brown rock that you see, it's called dolomite. Dolomite's a mineral, and encased in all of this dolomite is salt. Here you can see uh, a better picture where you can see salt uh, coming out of the dolomite. Salt has a lot of good uses. And Jesus will often talk about salt in a positive light. You are the salt of the world, right? But salt can also have negative uses. The Assyrians, they're the nation that conquered the northern tribes of Israel. They had a habit, after they conquered a land, of taking salt and spreading it into all the fields and crops so that crops couldn't grow. That's why this region is so dry and so desolate because of all the salt. Nothing can grow here. You'd have a hard time growing a garden here. Salt has many positive uses. Uh, for one thing, it helps your food taste better. But salt can also have negative uses. It can be used to keep crops from growing. If there's salt in the soil, plants won't grow. In the same way, if there's sin in our lives, faith might have a difficult time growing. I want to talk about the salt of our sin, and specifically the salt of betrayal. Every time we sin against God and turn away from Him, we betray him. And that salt stings. It burns. Think about that phrase, rubbing salt in the wound. If you have an open cut and you get salt in it, it stings. It hurts. Throughout scripture, throughout history, God has experienced the burning, painful salt of our betrayal. I want to read to you from our Old Testament reading. This comes from Isaiah chapter 53, verses 1 through 5. This is a familiar reading for the season of Lent. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his stripes we are healed. Now this is an Old Testament prophecy pointing to Jesus, who would firsthand experience the salt of betrayal, as one of his own would betray him, handing him over to be arrested. But it wasn't just Judas who would betray Jesus, we all did. Every time we sin, we betray Jesus and heap that salt on Jesus' wounds. But Jesus wasn't the first time that God experienced the salt of betrayal. God experienced the salt of betrayal throughout the history of Scripture. I want for a moment to go to Mount Carmel. Mount Carmel is a place where you'll find all kinds of beautiful gardens. This is also a place where once upon a time, the salt of betrayal was exposed. This picture was taken from the top of Mount Carmel. Today Mount Carmel is the location of the Carmelite Monastery, housing the Carmelite Order. And the Carmelites are known for their gardens. 
They love their gardens. Within the boundaries of the monastery, you find all kinds of beautiful gardens filled with flowers and succulents, all kinds of beautiful plants. The Carmelites love their gardens. But once upon a time, on the top of this mountain, it was a different story. It was on the top of Mount Carmel where God called Elijah to meet with his people. His people, under the reign of King Ahab, had salted their faith. They had betrayed God. Instead of worshiping God, they worshiped Baal. And so God had Elijah meet with the prophets of Baal on the top of Mount Carmel to have a little contest. You might remember the story. They built two altars. And then each group prayed to their God. Whichever God sent fire down on their altar first, that was the one true God. It was hundreds of prophets of Baal versus one prophet of God versus Elijah. Prophets of Baal went first. They prayed and prayed. They made noise. They sung. They danced. They slashed each other with knives. They did all they could to get their God's attention, but no fire fell on their altar. Then Elijah did something unusual. He had water poured upon his altar on all the wood, dug a trench around the altar, filling the trench with water. And he got on his knees and said a simple prayer. And then fire fell down from heaven on his altar and consumed it, proving that God was the one true God. Too often, our sin is like salt. The salt of betrayal leads us to turn away from God and turn to other gods, turn to other things that can't help us. Here we're reminded there is only one God, the one true God, the God of Elijah, the God who came into this world as a man, the God whom we call Jesus. Jesus was no ordinary man. Jesus was God himself in human flesh. That Thursday night of Holy Week, the night that we call Maundy Thursday, after Jesus celebrated the Passover meal with his disciples, he took them to the Mount of Olives and specifically took them to the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus went to pray. As Jesus finished praying, he looked up and saw torches in the distance. Here we have the Gospel according to Matthew, the 26th chapter, beginning with the 47th verse. While Jesus was still speaking to his disciples, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a great crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man sees him. And Judas came up to Jesus at once and said, Greetings, Rabbi. And he kissed him. And Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you came to do. Then they came up and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. And behold, one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Then Jesus said, Put your sword back into its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my Father and he will at once send me more than twelve legions of angels? But how then should the scriptures be fulfilled that it must be so? That hour Jesus said to the crowds, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day I sat in the temple teaching and you did not seize me. But all this has taken place that the scripture of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples left Jesus and fled. Here in this garden, Jesus experiences salt. He experiences the salt of betrayal. 
This is the Garden of Gethsemane, located towards the foot of the Mount of Olives as you go to Jerusalem. This is where Jesus last walked a free man. This is where Jesus took his disciples to pray. And this is where Jesus met the salt of betrayal as one of his own friends, one of his own disciples, Judas, led the soldiers to arrest him, to tie his hands, to march him into Jerusalem where he would be put on trial, where he would be sentenced to death, where he would die on the cross. As Jesus is betrayed, he remains faithful. He remains faithful to his Father. He remains faithful to his purpose. He remains faithful to you. He remains faithful as he tells Peter to put his sword away. He remains faithful as he allows the soldiers to, to tie his hands and arrest him. He remains faithful as he begins his final journey to the cross. Even though you would sin against him, you would betray him, Jesus remains faithful to you. He loves you. He forgives you. He dies for you. Next week, we continue to explore the places of the Passion. We go to the outer courtyard where Jesus will first be put on trial before the high priest. Pray God's blessings on your week. We'll see you next week. Amen. Together we confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We now turn to the Lord in prayer. I'll conclude each petition by saying, Lord, in your mercy, and please respond by saying, hear our prayer. We pray. Heavenly Father, you have not promised us a stormless life. You don't offer quick fixes or shallow solutions, but you do promise a perfect peace in the midst of whatever happens. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, when we're out of bootstraps to pull up, come to the end of our rope and feel like quitting, you are with us and for us. Thank you for being a Father who will never forget or abandon us in our storms. Thank you for working all things together for the good of those who love you. 
Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your perfect peace, a peace perfectly suited for the moment. Our calling is not to take control, but to mine the riches of the gospel and never lose sight of your wonderful love. You are the rock that is higher than us, the rock of refuge, the rock of ages. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we praise and thank you for your peace that surpasses all understanding. Anchor us in hope, strengthen us in grace, and fortify us with resolute courage. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now we receive the blessing of our God. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift up his face, shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. That concludes our service for tonight. I pray that you will join us next week as we continue our tour of the places of the Passion. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen.